Hey fourth graders, it's Miss Gans, ready to read you another chapter of Number the Stars. If you have not watched the first video, now is a really great opportunity for you to go watch it. It's here on YouTube, or your teachers might have added it to some kind of Google Classroom or Facebook Classroom or whatever they're using as well. So if you haven't done that yet, please do that first. If not, we're about to read chapter two which is titled, Who is the Man Who Rides Past? So as we remember what happened last in our book is that Anne-Marie and Ellen were running down the street when a couple of Nazis found them, and that really scared Ellen and Mrs. Rosen especially. It scared Anne-Marie and her mother, but we noticed that the people who were most frightened were Ellen and Mrs. Rosen. That's going to be important as we go on in our book. So we are on chapter two, who is the man who rides past? And we are going to begin. Tell me a story, Anne-Marie, begged Kirsty as she snuggled beside her sister in the big bed they shared. Tell me a fairy tale. Anne-Marie smiled and wrapped her arms around her little sister in the dark. All Danish children grew up familiar with fairy tales. Hans Christian Andersen, the most famous of the tale tellers had been Danish himself. Do you want the one about the Little Mermaid? That one had always been Anne Marie's own favorite. But Kirsty said no. Tell one that starts with the king and the queen, and they have a beautiful daughter. All right. Once upon a time there was a king, Anne Marie began. And a queen, whispered Kirsty. Don't forget the queen. And a queen. They lived together in a wonderful palace and... Was the palace named Amaliagberg? Kirsty asked sleepily. Shh, don't keep interrupting or I'll never finish the story. No, it wasn't Amaliagberg. It was a pretend place. Anne-Marie talked on, making up a story of a king and queen and their beautiful daughter, Princess Kirsten. She sprinkled her tail with formal balls, fabulous gold-trimmed gowns, and feasts of pink-frosted cupcakes, until Kirsty's deep, even breathing told her that her sister was sound asleep. She stopped, waited for a moment, half expecting Kirsty to murmur, then what happened? But Kirsty was still. Anne-Marie, Anne-Marie's thoughts turned to the real king, Christian X and the real palace, Amaliaberg, where he lived in the center of Copenhagen. How the people of Denmark loved King Christian! He was not like fairy tale kings, who seemed to stand on balconies giving orders to subjects, or who sat on golden thrones demanding to be entertained and looking for suitable husbands for their daughters. King Christian was a real human being, a man with a serious, kind face. She had seen him often, when she was younger. Each morning, he had come from the palace on his horse, Jubilee, and ridden alone through the streets of Copenhagen, greeting his people. Sometimes, when Anne-Marie was a little girl, her older sister, Lise, had taken her to stand on the sidewalk so that she could wave to King Christian. Sometimes he had waved back to the two of them and smiled. Now you are f special forever, Lise had once told her, because you have been greeted by a king. Anne-Marie turned her head on the pillow and stared through the partly opened curtains of the window into the dim September night. Thinking of Lise, her solemn, lovely sister, always made her sad. So she turned her thoughts again to the king, who was still alive, as Lise was not. She remembered a story that Papa had told her shortly after the war began, shortly after Denmark had surrendered and the soldiers had moved in overnight to take their places on the corners. One evening, Papa had told her that earlier he was on an errand near his office, standing on the corner waiting to cross the street, when King Christian came by on his morning ride. One of the German soldiers had turned, suddenly, and asked a question of a teenage boy nearby. Who is that man who rides past here every morning on his horse? The German soldier had asked. Papa said he had smiled to himself, amused that the German soldier did not know. He listened while the boy answered. He is our king, the boy told the soldier. He is the king of Denmark. Where is his bodyguard? The soldier had asked. And do you know what the boy said? 
Papa had asked Dan Marie. She was sitting on his lap while she was little then, only seven years old. She shook her head, waiting to hear the answer. The boy looked right at the soldier, and he said, All of Denmark is his bodyguard. Anne Marie had shivered. It sounded like a very brave answer. Is it true, Papa? she asked. What the boy said? Papa thought for a moment. He always considered questions very carefully before he answered them. Yes, he said at last. It is true. Any Danish citizen would die for King Christian to protect him. You too, Papa? Yes. And Mama? Mama too. Anne-Marie shivered again. Then I would too, Papa, if I had to. They sat silently for a moment. From across the room, Mama watched them. Anne-Marie and Papa. And she smiled. Mama had been crocheting that evening three years ago. The lacy edging of a pillowcase part of Lisa's trousseau. Her fingers moved rapidly, turning the thin white thread into an intricate narrow border. Lise was a grown-up girl of 18, then about to be married to Peter Nielsen. When Lise and Peter married, Mama said, Anne-Marie and Kirsty would have a brother for the very first time. Papa, Anne-Marie had said, finally into the silence. Sometimes I wonder why the king wasn't able to protect us. Why didn't he fight the Nazis so that they wouldn't come into Denmark with their guns? Papa sighed. We are such a tiny country, he said. And they are such an enormous enemy. Our king was wise. He knew how few soldiers Denmark had. He knew that many, many Danish people would die if we fought. In Norway they fought, Anne-Marie pointed out. Papa nodded. They fought very fiercely in Norway. They had those huge mountains for the Norwegian soldiers to hide in. Even so, Norway was crushed. In her mind, Anne-Marie had pictured Norway as she remembered it from the map at school. Up above Denmark. Norway was pink on the school map. She imagined the pink strip of Norway crushed by a fist. Are there German soldiers in Norway now, the same as here? Yes, Papa said. In Holland, too, Mama added from across the room, in Belgium and France. But not in Sweden, Anne-Marie announced, proud that she knew so much about the world. Sweden was blue on the map, and she had seen Sweden, even though she had never been there. Standing behind Uncle Heinrich's house, north of Copenhagen, she had looked across the water, the part of the North Sea that was called the Kattegat, to the land on the other side. That is Sweden you are seeing, Uncle Heinrich had told her. You are looking across to another country. That is true, Papa had said. Sweden is still free. So we just got a little bit of a history lesson in what we just read. So we read that Norway tried to stand up to the Nazis, but that they were crushed, meaning that they did not win, the Nazis won. Which is one of the reasons why Denmark didn't fight against the Nazis, because they thought, we can't survive this either. Now when they're talking about Sweden, they talk about how Sweden is free. So Sweden was a, so Sweden was a country that was free during this time, and that's an important thing for us to remember. So we are back on the words and now on page 16. And now, three years later, it was still true. But much else had changed. King Christian was getting old, and he had been badly injured last year in a fall from his horse. Faithful old Jubilee, who had carried him around Copenhagen so many mornings. For days, they thought he would die, and all of Denmark had mourned. But he hadn't. King Christian X was still alive. It was Elise who was not. It was her tall, beautiful sister who had died in an accident two weeks before her wedding. In the blue carved trunk in the corner of the bedroom, Anne-Marie could see its shape even in the dark. Were little folded Lise's pillowcases with their crocheted edges, her wedding dress with its hand-embroidered neckline, unworn. And the yellow dress that she had worn and danced in 
with its full skirt flying at the party celebrating her engagement to Peter. Mama and Papa never spoke of Lise. They never opened the trunk. But Anne Marie did from time to time when she was alone in the apartment. Alone, she touched Lise's things gently, remembering her quiet, soft spoken sister who had looked forward so to marriage and children of her own. Red headed Peter, her sister's fiance, had not married anyone in the years since Lise's death. He had changed a great deal. Once he had been like a fun loving older brother to Anne Marie and Kirsty, teasing and tickling, always a source of foolishness and pranks. Now, he still stopped by the apartment often, and his greetings to the girls were warm and smiling, but he was usually in a hurry, talking quickly to Mama and Papa about things Anne Marie didn't understand. He no longer sang the nonsense songs that had once made Anne Marie and Kirsty shriek with laughter, and he never lingered anymore. Papa had changed, too. He seemed much older and very tired, defeated. The whole world had changed. Only the fairy tales remained the same. And they lived happily ever after. Anne Marie recited, whispering into the dark, completing the tale for her sister, who slept beside her, one thumb in her mouth. So we're going to stop here for today, and I will read chapter three to you next week. Um, one thing that I do want you to keep in mind is the question that we're going to pose to you guys at the end of this chapter. So it is, why do you think Anne Marie's parents never open up the trunk or talk about Lee's? So I want you thinking about why Anne Marie's parents aren't opening the trunk, aren't looking through those things, and aren't thinking about their daughter Lee's. So that is the question that we have for you for your reading of chapter two. I hope you enjoyed it and I will talk to you guys next week. Bye.